This is a brief video of the diabetic foot. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of the diabetic foot. As in all of these videos, the color coding is in the top right, and I'll be clearing all of the boxes and talking through them one by one as we repopulate the flowchart. Let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> now, a diabetic foot is a combination of many things. It can include ulcers, and there are many subtypes of ulcers that we'll discuss. Those ulcers can lead to infection of the skin and soft tissue, which can then spread to the bone, and you'll have osteomyelitis. And that's not to mention the structural abnormalities of the diabetic foot, which includes hammer toe, claw toe, as well as the Charcot foot, the diabetic neuropathic arthropathy. So we'll get into all of that and more. So let's go ahead and start with the etiology. As the name implies, this all starts with diabetes mellitus, which causes many metabolic and biochemical changes in your body. Some of those changes, of course, by definition, is chronic hyperglycemia. And this has a number of downstream effects. It can affect your nerves, first of all, so you can have a peripheral sensory neuropathy, as well as an autonomic neuropathy. In addition, this can also predispose you to peripheral artery disease. So it's been shown that chronic hyperglycemia predisposes you to atherosclerosis, which in the heart can cause heart attacks, in the brain can cause strokes, but in the limbs can cause peripheral artery disease. And that's what's relevant when we're talking about the diabetic foot. In addition, diabetes leads to sorbitol accumulation in the cells, and this leads to microvascular changes, thickening of the medial layer of your vasculature. So that can lead to narrowing of your blood vessel lumens because of sorbitol accumulation. And these are the etiologies that are going to lead to ulcers, and I'll explain that in just a second. So one type of ulcer is called a neuropathic ulcer, and this one is related to the neuro changes induced by chronic hyperglycemia. So that makes sense. Another type of ulcer is called ischemic ulcer, and this one is associated with the microvascular and uh, vessel changes, the cardiovascular changes associated with diabetes. That also makes sense. There's also a type of ulcers that's kind of in between that has features of both, the neuroischemic ulcer. And all of these etiologies predispose you to the neuroischemic ulcer. Now, ulcers themselves are when your skin is broken down with possible skin uh, necrosis, with, with possible surrounding tissue necrosis. The neuropathic ulcers tend to occur in places of repetitive stress and repetitive trauma. So this is like at the bottom of your foot, like at the pad of your foot, the metatarsal bones, as well as the heel of your foot, places where you're constantly pressing, constantly doing repetitive motion. If you have any bony abnormalities, those can also be predisposed to having a neuropathic ulcer. The ischemic ulcers tend to occur on the toes or in the lateral foot, so the places the furthest away from the blood supply. So the very tips of the toes might have ischemic ulcers. These ulcers are usually painless, and that's partially because you have nerve damage anyway. So your sensation is going to be weakened in that area. So a lot of times people get these diabetic ulcers and they don't even realize it. And that's why it's important during your preventative care visits to constantly test the feet of your patients with diabetes. In addition, you can have sensory loss and motor weakness. Again, that's related to the sensory neuropathy that you already have that caused the ulcer to begin with. And you can have associated cool feet as well as no palpable pulses. And that's, of course, related to the peripheral artery disease that predisposed you to having these ulcers to begin with. Now, there are some other risk factors for these ulcers. Having calluses might predispose you. Having trauma to your feet, in addition to the sites of stress and trauma that you get, um, neuropathic ulcers can also predispose you. And having infections, like having a fungal infection on your foot, can predispose it to developing into an ulcer. Now, infections predispose you to ulcers, but then ulcers also predispose you to infections. Ulcers are a break in the skin, of course, and when you're breaking that barrier, that, um, that immunological barrier, you're predisposing your skin and your soft tissue to getting infected. And in fact, approximately 50% of ulcers have a skin and soft tissue infection associated with it. There are some pathogens that we found most commonly cause these infections. These are the staph species and strep species, but in most cases these are polymicrobial ulcers, and it doesn't make much sense to really identify one organism. There's likely multiple organisms 
in an ulcer. It's also worth mentioning that diabetes predisposes you to having infections to begin with. So diabetes impairs your immune system in a number of ways. It decreases cytokine production. It causes defects in phagocytosis. Remember, that's when your immune system eats up or swallows up foreign invaders, foreign microbes. And it also leads to general immune cell dysfunction. So all of this impaired immune system predisposes you to getting these pathogens that might infect a diabetic foot ulcer. You have some pretty um, unique symptoms to an infected ulcer. This includes edema or swelling, induration or like a hard feeling, erythema, especially when the erythema is bigger than half a centimeter in diameter, that might signify that you have an infection. Tenderness, of course, unless the patient is completely numb due to the neuropathy. Warmth might so signify an infection. And purulent exudates can, of course, be an infection since that infection creates that pus, that purulent exudate. In very severe cases, you can have an infection that produces gas, and this can cause gas gangrene. And here's a, an unpleasant picture of a diabetic foot ulcer that has many of these features. Edema, it looks like it might be indurated around the edges here. It definitely looks like a big area of erythema. Uh, I imagine it's tender, although the patient might be numb. It looks warm to me, and looks like there's some purulent exudate around the edges, and there's gas gangrene there as well. So this is a good picture for all of the features of an infected diabetic skin or di diabetic foot ulcer. In even more severe cases, you can have this skin infection spread to the bone. This is what's called osteomyelitis. There are, of course, many things that predispose you to getting osteomyelitis. The impaired immune system does not help, and these bugs are often the ones that cause the osteomyelitis since they're already in the diabetic foot ulcer. There are some if the ulcer gets kind of big, if the ulcer is bigger than two centimeters squared or has a depth of greater than three millimeters, that's a good sign that you have osteomyelitis. And if the ulcer is overlying a bony prominence or if you see exposed bone inside the ulcer, that's also a good sign that you have osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis has some unique manifestations. It can lead to an ulcer that's chronic, that lasts for weeks, and that's treatment resistant. It can You can have a positive probe to bone test. This is when you touch the ulcer and immediately touch bone um, at the end of your probe, at the end of a stick, essentially, that you're putting inside the ulcer. That's a good test for osteomyelitis. You can have very high ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rates, greater than 70 might signify osteomyelitis. And this can also lead to a leukocytosis. So oftentimes patients will have an unexplained leukocytosis. You can do a couple tests for osteomyelitis and that might explain the high white blood cells. So infection starts in the skin and soft tissues as the ulcer and then it spreads to the bone and it becomes very difficult to treat. And it often becomes a chronic ulcer that the patient then has for a while. Now we've talked about the infection and the kind of skin infection of the diabetic foot ulcer. Now let's work our way to the structural changes that results from the diabetic foot. These predominantly come from the peripheral sensory neuropathy. So if the patient is not able to feel their foot, so they're not able to step normally and constantly using their feet, especially if it's infected like this, can lead to structural changes that makes it even harder to use their feet and makes it even harder for these ulcers to heal. So there is a bit of a, a vicious cycle here. As the uh, ulcers get worse, they have these structural changes, make it hard to exercise, make it hard to move, and kind of worsens their diabetic foot from there. So the, the peripheral sensory neuropathy causes a couple things. It can decrease your intrinsic muscle volume. If you don't have sensation in a limb and you're not using it normally, that can lead to atrophy of your muscles. It can also lead to thickening of the plantar aponeuroses. Both of these lead to the hammer toe and claw toe abnormalities. Hammer toe is when you have the PIP joint flexion, and you might also have DIP joint extension and possible MTP joint hyperextension, but it's really characterized by the PIP joint flexion. Claw toe is when you have the PIP joint flexion, the DIP joint extension, and the MTP joint hyperextension. So those pretty characteristically look like a hammer and a toe, and those are caused by structural changes due to peripheral neuropathy in diabetes. Next, you can have bone destruction as well as subluxation and dislocation of the joints, and these lead to what's called diabetic neuropathic arthropathy, also known as charcot foot.
In early stages, Charcot foot might have mild to moderate pain. This is when the patient is not completely numb and when they still have a bit of sensation in their foot. What really damages the foot is the chronic state of inflammation from the bone destruction and from the dislocation of the joints. So the joint themselves might be swollen, they might be warm, they might be red with erythema. Over time, they'll start to be deformed even more and they'll eventually become painless as the foot becomes numb. This can lead to midfoot collapse and you'll have a characteristic rocker bottom foot deformity. So there, the foot of the, of the patient eventually becomes convex and it sticks out and it looks like a rocker bottom. In very late stage cases, you can have osteolysis. Essentially, your bone is being eaten away. You might notice that on imaging and that can lead to fractures of the foot, which makes the foot not usable at all. So it really is like a slow decline from the infection to the structural differences and the essentially osteolysis and fractures and to being able to not use that limb. And it is pretty unfortunate. All of these factors, as I mentioned, the infection, the ulcers, the osteomyelitis, the structural changes, really increase the patient's rate of hospitalization, amputation, and death. So this is really an unfortunate outcome of diabetes. And it's a good reason to stay on top of the patient's diabetes and keep doing your foot exams as frequently as possible and treat these as best as you can. This has been a video on the diabetic foot. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.